Hello everyone, my name is Zala Al Sayed. I'm a medical student at King Saud bin Abdulaziz University for Health Sciences. Uh, today I'll basically talk about acute diarrhea and subacute diarrhea. So let's start. This is a brief outline for what I'm going to talk about. So let's start by general principles. So the definition of diarrhea, what is diarrhea? Now diarrhea is the passage of loose watery stool at least three times per day. And another definition might be passing more stool than usual. Now diarrhea is classified based on the duration into acute, subacute, and chronic. Now acute starts from day one and up to 14 days. Now more than 14 days and up to a month is considered as subacute or also called persistent diarrhea. More than four weeks is called chronic diarrhea, which will be discussed in a separate video by my colleague. Another classification of diarrhea can be according to the etiology. Now we can classify acute diarrhea into community acquired and into nosocomial or hospital acquired diarrhea. We will first start talking about community acquired diarrhea. Now community acquired diarrhea can be classified according to the etiology into viral or bacterial causes. Now viral causes are the most common cause of the uh, acquired diarrhea. And they also have an acute onset, like happening in less than 72 hours. The most common viruses are rotavirus and norovirus, with rotavirus even being more common. Uh, rotavirus, you need to think about it in uh, children, infants, and in win winter time actually, because uh, the immunity is actually age-related. We also have norovirus, as we already mentioned, and also adenovirus. Adenovirus, think about it in summertime, and influenza virus. Now, moving on to bacterial causes, they actually uh, take a course uh, of less than seven days, except for salmonella, which sometimes takes even a longer period of time, moving into the subacute cause of diarrhea. Now, uh, the bacterial causes can be subdivided according to the nature of the symptoms into severe watery diarrhea and into uh, dysentery or bloody diarrhea enteric fever, and diarrheal disease with vomiting as a prominent feature. We will talk about every single one in detail. First, let's talk about severe watery diarrhea. Now, in watery diarrhea, the fluid loss is from the proximal small intestine. You need to know something. The small intestine actually absorbs a lot of water. And that's why when you lose uh, the water from the small intestine, you actually lose a lot of water. And... The second thing you have is without cellular injury. And why is that important? If you're not getting cellular injury, you're not getting inflammation, you're not getting fever. Okay, the common microorganisms include uh, vibrio cholera, enterotoxicogenic uh, E. coli, salmonella, and listeria. Now, all watery diarrhea take an acute um, a period like they develop really fast and a, br a brief period of one to three days. They are usually self limited except the one in red, which is Vibrio cholera. Vibrio cholera can be so severe and actually causing dehydration, and sometimes you need to treat the patient. So, the most severe kind of watery diarrhea is caused by Vibrio cholera. Now, let's talk more about Vibrio cholera. It belongs to the Vibria group. Uh, they are gram-negative rods, which are curved. They have long filamentous pili. The pili will help in attachment. They're found in salty water. And that's why you can get them from untreated water supply, from poor sanitation, or undercooked shellfish. Now, the important thing to know about watery diarrhea. Watery diarrhea is caused by toxins. This is an important information to know. So now cholera has a toxin called cholera toxin, apparently, and it actually is an AB toxin. So it has two subunits of A and five subunits of B. We will see them in the figure right now. So what happens here is that first the bacteria will come into the intestine, into the small intestine. It will find its place and then use its pili actually to attach to the cells. Okay, once the bacteria is in place, it releases its toxin, which is cholera toxin. Now, as you can see, you have five B subunits. B subunits. 
bind to receptor. Okay, so the B subunits will bind to the receptor, and as they bind, they will allow the A subunits to enter the cell. Now, the A subunits go inside, they dis dissociate from each other, and then the one causing all the action is A1. The A1 subunit will increase the adenocyclase, which will increase the cyclic AMP within the cell. Now, increase in cyclic AMP within the cell will cause the excretion of the nutrients, like sodium, water, chloride, potassium, and bicarbonate. Now, the loss of those nutrients is what causes the diarrhea. Now, an important point to mention here is that when sodium is lost, it is actually lost into the lumen as the same concentration as it is in the plasma. So when you end up with dehydration because of sodi uh, sodium loss and water loss, you end up with an isotonic dehydration because you're losing sodium in the same concentration as it's in the plasma. Plus, you're losing water, water with it. Now, but on the other hand, you have potassium and bicarbonate loss. Now, potassium and bi bicarbonate loss will actually be two to five times more in the lumen or lost than in the actually constant their concentration in the plasma. So you lose a lot of potassium and a lot of bicarbonate in cholera. So uh, fluid loss will give you diarrhea. And the character of the diarrhea is rice water stool. Actually, the patient might tell you it has a milky appearance or it looks like as if it's water that has been rinsed with rice. And this is an important information in actually scenarios and MCQ questions. Now, it can cause a dehydration, as we mentioned, isotonic dehydration. Now, if the dehydration is severe, you might get a hypovolemic shock. Now, cholera actually can lead to loss of liters of water per day, and that's why you have to look for signs of dehydration in the patient, like shrunken eyes, loss of skin elasticity, um, dry mouth, and other signs of dehydration. Now, loss of potassium will give you hypokalemia. Hypokalemia can cause arrhythmia and muscle cramps or uh, weakness. Now, loss of bicarbonate will give you metabolic acidosis. And this, is, uh, this also likes to come in like MCQ questions. Now, as you can see, as you can see, we did not have any inflammation. All what happened is the toxin played with the cell machinery, uh, played with the enzymes, it caused more uh, excretion of the water and nutrients. But we did not have any inflammation or actually damage to the mucosa. And that's why in watery diarrhea, you rarely find fever. That fever requires inflammation. Now, you don't have inflammation. An important point also to mention, you have to have, as a clinician, a high index of clinical suspicion. Because cholera actually requires a special kind of stain for culture. Other organisms causing water diarrhea is intratoxigenic uh, E. coli. Uh, it's actually a gram-negative rod uh, from intrabacteria group. Uh, it's a normal colonizer of the lower GI in the human being. Now, the mechanism of diarrhea is the same as cholera by producing toxins. Uh, instead, it has two toxins, okay? One is called labile toxin and the other is called stable toxin. Now, the labile toxin is exactly the same as cholera toxin, same mechanism of action, except that it is actually weaker. And that's why the uh, diarrhea, watery diarrhea caused by E. coli will be actually less severe than the one caused by cholera. Now, the other toxin is the stable toxin, and um, it actually has the same mechanism of action, but instead of increasing cyclic AMP, as in cholera toxin and label toxin, it will increase a cyclic GMP. This is basically the same thing we just talked about. We will now take the other classification of bacterial diarrhea. We will take the dysentery or the bloody diarrhea. Okay. Talking about the dysentery, now the colon is the pri primary site of action of the organisms causing dysentery. Now why is it important? Now the colon actually does not absorb that much of water and that's why you'll find that in dysentery the stool is in smaller volume than in watery diarrhea. And also, the organism cause, uh, organisms causing dysentery will produce inflammation or changes, meaning damage, in the colonic mucosa.
by either the in direct invasion of the bacteria itself into the mucosa or the production of cytokines, wh which will give you actually inflammation. Now, why will you get blood? When you get damage to the mucosa, you get the blood. And now why do you get pus? You get inflammation, you get white blood cells, you get pus. Now, generally, the dysentery lasts longer than watery diarrhea, but it still like lasts from two to seven days. Remember, uh, watery diarrhea lasts from one to three days. And also, you have fever, abdominal pain, fever because of inflammation, abdominal pain and cramps, and tenismus. Uh, are prominent symptoms, especially tenismus, they like to put it in these scenarios. Now, vomiting occurs less often here. Common pathogens here include Shigella, uh, Campylobacter, and Salmonella. Actually, they are the most common causes of dysentery. Remember, we already mentioned Salmonella as a cause of watery diarrhea. But you need to know something. Salmonella causes dysentery more than it causes watery diarrhea, but it can cause both. Campylobacter and Salmonella are associated with poultry, eggs, and milk. So if you got a question like a uh, patient ate uh, chicken sandwiches or something and uh, a couple of hours later he develops bloody diarrhea, what is the most common uh, organism, a possible organism causing this diarrhea? You can go for Campylobacter or Salmonella because they're the, like the most common organisms. Other organisms are intrahemorrhagic E. coli. Uh, it actually causes hemorrhagic colitis, which is bloody um, diarrhea. Now, E. coli uh, O157H7 is actually a subtype of this one. Uh, it's a specific stereotype. Now, it's associated with the development of hemolytic uremic syndrome. Or they have lysis of red blood cells. An important thing to mention here, never give them antibiotics or platelets. Although they have low platelets, but don't give them antibiotics. It increases the lysis of red blood cells. And don't give them platelets because you're actually like giving the bacteria something to work on. So don't give them both. Now, uh, another uh, type of E. coli is intra-invasive. Now, this one causes dysentery. Now, you have also Vibrio parahemolyticus. It is associated with selfish consumption. And Vibrio valnificus is, uh, has an increased incidence in patients with liver disease or high iron state, uh, status. Because actually... Um, it thrives uh, on iron, that's why. And the last thing is Yersinia, uh, Yersinia species. Now, an important thing to mention, dysentery is mostly caused by gram-negative rods. This is an important slide to memorize. Now, what uh, organisms cause bloody stool? You can memorize them in the word chess. Now, C for Campylobacter, H for hemorrhagic E. coli, uh, and E for um, Antamoeba hyselitica and S for Salmonella and Chigella. So let's start explaining how do you get dysentery by taking an example of Shigella. Now Shigella causes Shigellosis and uh, Shigella is actually a gram-negative bacteria. It's sisters with E. coli. It's an introbacteria. Shigella will actually come and invade the uh, introcytes. So after invasion, it avoids phagocytosis. So here it invaded the cell, avoided phagocytosis, and then it multiplies inside the cell. So as it multiplies, it wants to move and infect other cells. How does it do that? It forms a finger-like projection. As you can see, it like pushes itself outside. It causes a finger-like projection in the membrane of the cell itself. And eventually, this finger-like projection will pinch off, meaning that the membrane will actually be disrupted or destroyed. And what does all of this cause? It will first go to the other cell, infect more cells. And second of all, it will actually cause the ulceration uh, in the mucosa. Why? Because you're breaking a lot of membranes. You're getting ulceration in the mucosa of the intestine. So the ulceration actually is what causes bleeding. So always ulcers are prone to bleed, right? And that's why you get blood in the stool. Now, why do you get white blood cells in the stool? Or why do you get pus in the stool? 
So it's quite simple. If the bacteria invades even more, reaching to lamina propria, it will produce an inflammatory response because it's actually an abnormal uh, kind of organism uh, reaching an abnormal site for it. So it will produce an inflammatory response by also producing cytokines and stuff. And when it produces this inflammatory response, uh, white blood cells are actually recruited and eventually you get pus or white blood cells in the stool. Now, all of this caused a lot of damage to the mucosa and you eventually get the diarrhea. And the triad of blood, pus, and diarrhea is what we call the dysentery. Another mechanism of uh, destruction in Shigella is actually the Shigella toxin. Now, not all Shigella have the toxin, but if they have the toxin, they're like more superpower Shigellas. Now, the toxin actually causes capillary thrombosis and inflammation of the colonic mucosa, and eventually this leads to something called hemorrhagic colitis. Uh, uh, the uh, mucosa will start to bleed, and you'll get a bloody diarrhea. This slide is an explanation of what I said in the graph in the previous slide. This slide is also the same, uh, continuation to the explanation. Now let's take the manifestations of shigellosis. Shigellosis uh, or shigella can cause hemorrhagic colitis. Um, it can cause dysentery. Uh, and dysentery has a triad of abdominal cramps, uh, tenismus or uh, like painful defecation, and small volume of bloody muco uh, mucoid fecal discharge. Now you have to know something about shigellosis. It actually begins with a watery diarrhea, and fever and uh, systemic manifestations like myelase, anorexia, myalgia, and eventually this area becomes bloody, but it can begin with watery diarrhea. The third classification of bacterial uh, community acquired diarrhea is enteric or typhoid fever. Now, um, it's caused by Salmonella enterica, serover typhi. Now, um, it's a, a, actually a systemic infection, so uh, you have to uh, suspect like um, multiple organ involvement. Now, fever and abdominal pain are the main symptoms of uh, enteric fever. While diarrhea is actually not a constant fe feature of the disease. Now, it, during the whole course of the disease, you might have diarrhea once or even twice. Now, the, the disease also has a gradual onset, meaning that the fever and abdominal pain like happens gradually. The metastatic sites include the urinary tract, so it might get an UTI, bones, joints, and other organs. Now, uh, moving on to the last classification of bacterial diarrhea, we have diarrheal disease with vomiting as a prominent feature. So when you get vomiting, vomiting as a prominent feature, always think of food poisoning. Now, it usually happens uh, in less than 24 hours after ingestion. So the most common organisms are bacillus. It happens... Um, because of Chinese food and reheated rice, and you have staph aureus happening because of dairy, salads, and mostly in picnics. Like when you go to picnic and they have all the drinks in the refrigerators and you're leaving all the salads with mayonnaise outside, and you, uh, you have diarrhea the second day. So always think about dairy and salads. Now, in Clostridium, it happens after taking meat that has been sitting out for too long. So, you have to memorize these. These might come in scenarios. So, if they tell you someone was in a buffet and he ate rice, and the second day he has um, diarrhea, what do you think about? You think about bacillus. Someone was in a, in a picnic, what do you think about? You think about staph aureus, and etc. Now, we took community acquired. We will take next the nosocomial or hospital acquired diarrhea. In hospital acquired diarrhea, we will classify them according to the age group into infants and adults. Now, in infants, uh, the rotaviruses are the most common cause of uh, hospital acquired diarrhea. Uh, as we mentioned, it happens in winter time and in outbreaks. And the second organism is intrapathic E. coli. Now, intrapathic E. coli causes infantile diarrhea. Now, in adults, we classify them into antibiotic-associated and non-antibiotic-associated. In antibiotic-associated, the diarrhea can happen as an unwanted effect of side effect of a medication or the antibi uh, antibiotic used. 
And this might happen with erythromycin, augmentin, cephalexin, and because of prolonged use of the antibiotic. Now, prolonged use of antibiotics actually cause the normal flora of the gut to be like killed, okay? So other bacteria like uh, Clostridium difficile will actually overgrow, giving this diarrhea. And this diarrhea is called Clostridium difficile associated diarrhea. Now, any antibiotic can cause Clostridium difficile uh, um, associated diarrhea, but clindamycin is actually an important one to mention. Now, Clostridium difficile overgrowth actually requires a minimum of three days of antibiotics, and this is very important, and actually on average from five to ten days of antibiotic use. Why is it important? If the um, diarrhea happens really fast, like less than three days, it's most probably an unwanted effect of the antibiotic. But if you get a patient uh, hospitalized and on antibiotics for two weeks, think of Clostridium difficile. Now, an non-antibiotic associated diarrhea can be because of CD contrast, laxatives, magnesium, uh, sorbitol, and tube feeding diarrhea. They're most probably because of an osmotic effect, but we're not going to discuss that in detail. Moving on to subacute diarrhea. Now, subacute diarrhea is mostly caused uh, by other organisms other than bacteria. You need to know that bacteria is actually rare, with actually Salmonella being the one causing the subacute diarrhea. The most common two causes of subacute diarrhea are uh, Cryptosporidium and Giardia. Now, Cryptosporidium is a protozoa. And uh, Isospora belly and Cryptosporidium are found in HIV patients. And uh, Giardia causes watery diarrhea. So if you get a patient that has watery diarrhea but lasting to a long time, you think of Giardia immediately. Because other causes of watery diarrhea, as we mentioned, last from one to three days, but Giardia actually uh, causes a longer period of diarrhea. Also, Giardia causes diarrhea in travelers. Now, viruses like cytomegalovirus and HCV actually cause diarrhea in immunocompromised patients. Traveler's diarrhea. It's acquired through ingestion of fecally contaminated food, water, and ice. And that's why when you go out, try not to eat uh, like salads and raw meat. Go for uh, also bottled water. It's safe. Causes include uh, bacteria in 80% uh, of the cases. And also, um, in 50% of the cases, the bacteria is intratoxigenic uh, E. coli. And uh, in 10 to 20% uh, of the cases, it's caused by Shigella species. And other common causes are Campylobacter jejuni. The symptoms usually resolve in about a week. But if it stays longer, think of Giardia. For the diagnosis, uh, the first thing you need to do is uh, rule out infection. Now, you do the stool studies, and if all stool studies are negative, you go for endoscopy. So the best test is stool exam. Now, in stool exam, we'll actually take st uh, stool lactoferrin. Now, stool lactoferrin is actually uh, a test done for your stool to detect lactoferrin. Actually, lactoferrin is a glycoprotein produced by activated white blood cells. So if you have lactoferrin in your stool, this means you have inflammation. We mentioned already, inflammation is found with uh, dysentery or bloody diarrhea. And it's mostly caused by gram-negative rods. So you think about gram-negative rods. And if it was negative, this means that you have a non-bloody diarrhea. A non-bloody diarrhea can include a lot of things, like um, bacteria, parasite, protozoa, and viruses. Now, in bacteria, think about the things causing food poisoning. So uh, the patient will come with vomiting. Now, in parasites, you have to check for ova, and uh, actually, a more specific test is checking for Giardia antigen in the stool. For protozoa, check, uh, check for cysts and trophozoites, and for viruses, you actually exclude all the previous, and um, you think if they're not there, you might think of viruses. And also, some immune, uh, enzyme immunoassays might be done for rotavirus. Now we'll go to management. 
the management is divided on the type of diarrhea into bloody, non-bloody, and uh, C. difficile diarrhea. Now, um, first of all, let's take the bloody and non-bloody diarrhea. If the patient is stable, only observe the patient and give them uh, adequate fluid replacement. And uh, uh, why is that? Because most of the cases are actually self-limited. And if the, if the cases were severe enough, do not wait for culture, go for antibiotics. So if it was bloody diarrhea, you go for a sublofloxacin, a floxacin, and uh, plus or minus metronidazole. And if the, uh, the uh, um, organism was uh, verbrio uh, falnificus, go for doxycycline. And non-bloody diarrhea and severe cases go for sublofloxacin plus minus metronidazole, like the previous one. And for AIDS patients, if it was caused by uh, cryptosporidias, uh, go for paromomycin or metronidazole. And if it was caused by uh, isosporabelli, go for timethoprim. And in uh, Clostridium difficile, go for metronidazole. And if the symptoms abate and reoccur, meaning if the symptoms like become less and then come back again or like stop for a period and come back again, give metronidazole again. Why are we doing that? If the symptoms went for a period, this means that the patient actually like responded to metronidazole, metronidazole but the dose wasn't high enough or the frequency wasn't adequate. So either give the patient a higher dose or more times of the antibiotic. Now, if the symptoms do not go away after two days, you conclude that it's not sensitive to this kind of medication and you go for vancomycin. And in uh, Clostridium difficile, you'll actually find a Clostridium difficile toxin in the stool. Those are the references we used in the presentation. And for cases of acute uh, diarrhea and subacute diarrhea, you can go to the video about chronic diarrhea. We'll have cases about both. For any questions or comments, contact us through this email.